if I wanted to test, is this point belong to the X category or does this point belong to the O category? How will we test it? What will we feed to our network? We'll feed it in X1 of 2. So X1 will be 2 in this example. Okay, X2, we'll feed it 4.5. Okay, based on whatever weights it has learned, it will multiply, add, and produce the output. Okay, if it produced an output of 0, what would that mean? Or close to 0? It belongs to it. It belongs to X, but it's below the line. If it produced an output of 1, then it's above the line, right? So the goal of our designing this neural network will be to come up with uh, some training algorithm such that we give it a lot of examples. So for example, when we are training the network, okay, what we do is we create many known examples. By known means where we know what the expected output is going to be. Okay, so expected output is known. So let me see if you guys can recognize this. What if I give it an x1 of 2? Okay, uh, x2 of let's say 3. Okay, and what will be the expected output in this case? Okay, so once again, in your own mind, uh, the y coordinate is uh, your, uh, uh, sorry, the x2 is your y coordinate. So think of it this way. So if I feed in, uh, or, or, or think of it this way, this is x, this is y, right? Uh, x and y. So the point two three is it below this line or is it above this line? Below. It's below, right? So the x, this y is what we call in the neural network terminology expected output. Okay, so the expected output will be zero. On the other hand, if I feed in x one of three, x two of eleven, what will be the expected output? See if I feed in three, right? Three times two. 6 plus 3, 9, but the y value uh, for the data point is somewhere here, above the line. So uh, expected output will be 1. So this way we can create many, many examples, and then this is what we do to the neural network. We feed in one example, so in the beginning this will be random. So let me show you one simple example. So let's pretend randomly you s initialize w1 to be 0.1, randomly you initialize this to be 0.2, randomly you initialize it to be 0. Okay. Now you pick one example and you feed it. So x1 of 2, we multiply it by the weight. So what will it produce over here? Correct. Then x2 of 3 multiply by 0.2, right? Then 1 times 0, because whatever this, this input it for the bias is always 1. We never change it, okay? But the B value will make it learn, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, so from once we do this, then plus 1 times 0, this will be our output of this summation unit over here. So let me call this output S. So what will be the value of S then? 0.2 plus 0.6.8. Okay. Uh, so us uh, and for the time being, we are just bypassing this activation function, right? Okay. So this becomes our actual output based on the initial random weight. Okay. What was the expected output? Zero. So then we, what we do is we take a look at the expected output. Expected output is zero, right? 
So now what we do is we create some kind of a loss function on an error, or sometimes we call it error function. Okay. So in training a neural network, we define a loss or error function. Okay, so in this case, sometimes people call it E, or sometimes people call it uh, L, E for error, or L for loss. Okay, so that we can figure out how much is it incorrectly predicting the output so that we can go back and adjust the weights. Okay, so in this particular example, the error will be what was the uh, y minus a squared. Okay, y again is our terminology for expected output. Okay, everybody uses different terminology if you go online and start reading up on neural networks or deep learning, right? But I have my own terminology, uh, so I'll keep emphasizing this way, you know, after a while, will be pretty natural. Anytime I use the letter A, that means actual output. So this is what we expected, this is what we obtained, okay? So in our example, what will be the error? Y is what? Uh, expected output for the first training example was zero. So zero minus 0 0.8 squared. So 0 0.64 is our loss or error. Okay, so once we know how much error we have, then now what we can do is, so the next step in the training a neural network is, we go backwards. And this is called back propagation. In plain English, what's the purpose of back propagation? Based on the error, go back and adjust the weights, as well as the bias. Okay, so let me give you in plain English meaning of back propagation. So based on error. or loss, however you want to think of it. Uh, error and loss are, by the way, same thing. Some people use the loss terminology, some people use the error terminology. Based on error, go back and adjust weights and bias. Okay, in this example, it's a single neuron. Uh, so it will adjust the bias, okay? Um, so anyway, how exactly does this work? I'll give you more detail. For the time being, think of it this way. What this will do is it will go back and slightly reduce this value. It will go back, slightly increase or reduce this value. It will go back, slightly reduce or increase this value. How does it do it? Uh, I'll go into some mathematical detail soon. Uh, but anyway, so this is what we'll do, like feed in one input, compute the loss, go back, adjust these weights. Then we pick the second example. We feed in this example, feed in, compute the loss, go back, adjust these weights. Okay, let's pretend we have 1,000 training examples. So all of these are of our training examples. So training examples. Okay, so like I said, one by one we feed one example, produce the actual output, based on that compute the loss, Back propagate it, adjust the weight, then pick the second example, feed it, back propagate it, adjust the weight. So how many times will repeat this process if we have 1,000 training examples? 1,000 times, right? Okay, so will after 1,000 uh, times do it repeating this process, will those weights will be proper, meaning would it, would it have learned what we are trying to teach this network? Yes. The answer is yes and no. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so our typical code, and you'll get a better feel for it, goes like this. 
k. So in the, in the pseudocode format, k. Uh, so this is a loop through training examples. K forward pass the training example. Okay, or maybe I should say forward pass one training example. By forward pass, exactly I showed you, meaning pick the data. Whatever the initial weights or biases are, compute the sum, compute the output. Okay. Uh, so then, okay, compute loss. Okay, then back propagate. And Just wait. Okay, so how many times if we if I have thousand examples? Thousand, thousand times, right? So that thousand times is called one epoch in training in the neural network terminology. So that's one epoch, meaning e.g. if we have thousand training examples. We'll go through this loop thousand times, pick one example, and keep repeating as I mentioned. Right? Only thing I haven't told you so far is what is this back propagate? How do we adjust the weights? But don't worry, we're coming. We'll put complete detail in it so that you'll have a hundred percent understanding of how this works. Right? Okay. So as I hinted, even if we go through one thousand times, will the network? Would it have learned? this decision boundary, which is y equal to 2x plus 3 in our example, uh, yes or no? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay? If we pick the initial random weights, which were pretty far off, maybe not. Okay? So then typically what we do is we go through another loop for i equal to 0 to number of epochs. Okay. So, so basically we have two loops over here. The inner loop goes on each and every training example. Then we further repeat this whole process again, 10 times or 50 times or 100 times. Okay. So somebody may say, okay, let's try it for 100 epochs and see, is it learning? Is it uh, getting better as we train it? Okay. So let me ask you a simple question. Suppose you wrote this code. Okay. Uh, every epoch or every training example, it's adjusting the weights, right? Okay. Sometimes positive, meaning increasing the value, decreasing the value. Okay. How would we know as we go through each epoch, is it getting better or not? What would you do? is converging to uh, toward uh, zero, uh, toward the... Yes, yeah. So see if you take a look over here, remember we had defined a loss function? Okay, every time we train, what do we do? Compute the loss. If I print the loss, okay, um, maybe not over here because then it would be... <laughs> Okay, you can do it over here, but let's do this. After the end of the epoch, uh, after the end of the epoch, so, so this loop, let's pretend, ends over here. Let's print the loss over here. Okay, so if I plotted this loss, in the beginning the loss will be high, right? Then you will see gradually, okay, it will start to reduce, come close to a zero loss, okay? Um, so let's say we ran it for 20 epochs, and it's showing the graph up to that point somewhere over here. What does that tell you? Should we train it more or should we stop? 
to go to train more, right? But then somewhere over here, it starts to increase momentarily. Should we stop or continue training? Okay, now that becomes a little difficult decision, okay? Uh, because as you will learn, as we, if we overtrain it, then rather than it learning the function, it starts to memorize the function, okay? Meaning it will work well on our uh, training or the testing data, but if we give it unknown data, it may not work as well, okay? Uh, so typically we have what is called a validation set, and for the time being, don't worry about it, but for today's concept, if you can just think of it this way, how many epochs we have to run it through, okay? you start printing the loss. Uh, you can graph it or just visually see is the value going down. Even if it starts to go back a little bit up, you still wait a few more epochs to see will it eventually go down. If it doesn't go down and just stays something like this, then maybe whatever you, uh, at that point, is the best learned network. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, so hopefully you get an idea of how a single neural network, uh, sorry, a single neuron network is created and trained, okay? Now, uh, one of the things that I really uh, would, and I'll keep emphasizing it, is uh, to be really good in this field, you need three things, okay? You, or maybe four things, I, I'd say. You need to be fairly good in programming. Okay. You need to be able to visualize Okay, you, you should be able, the, the math that we will do over here is not complex. Okay, at, at most we'll deal with partial derivatives, maybe a few integrals, right? And that too, I completely clarify uh, some probability theory, expectations, uh, and moments, and so on. But I'll clarify each and every part, you know, in case you have forgotten. So that's not the hard part. But uh, what we need to develop is of taking a look at the equation and be able to see, okay, what kind of decision boundary as an example it will create, okay? So, for example, if you take a look at this neural network over here that I created, okay, uh, or let me try to ask you, okay, if I, let's go back to our original example, y equal to 2x plus 3. What kind of equation will it create? Straight line. Straight line. Everybody knows that, right? What if I go y equal to 2x squared plus 3? So now I will create some kind of uh, uh, c if x is 0, uh, what's y? 3. So some something like this, right? Or or maybe a little bit shifted of that. But anyway, we'll create some kind of a curve, right? Okay. Um, so that's in two dimensions, right? In two dimensions, uh, if we are not squaring the variable, it will always create a line. What if we are in three dimensions, okay? Meaning y equal to 2x, or let's make it z equal to better c equal to 2x plus 3y minus 5. What, if I plot it in three dimensions, what will it create? A plane. What's that? A plane. A plane. Okay, see, plane is, let me see if I have something here. Like, it's like a line, but like this would be a plane, right? Uh, uh, what about higher dimensions? As you will see, once we go into neural networks, we're dealing with you know thousands of dimensions. Sometimes, of course, we can we cannot visualize it. But if I had some equation, let's say uh, w equal to two x one plus three x two minus five x three plus six x four minus two point one x five, and so on, right? So none of the terms, 
none of the variables is square. Uh, everything is linear. So in uh, even if I stop at five, right? In the five-dimensional space, what will it create? Will it create a curved surface, or will it create some kind of a plane in five dimensions? Something in four di dimension. It will create because it's five-dimensional. Uh, we have five-dimensional data over here, right? Okay. So in the five dimension, will it be four dimension? One less. Uh, so that's the output. See, like over here, when I said, how many dimensions is this? That's two. That's three dimensions. So two, so in fact, this would be six dimensions. Okay. So regardless, it's five or six. My question is, if it's not being squared, what will it create? The plane in high dimensions is called a hyperplane. So again, think of it even though we cannot visualize it, but just like I showed you. Okay, so it will be something straight, like a flat surface, but in high dimensions, right? Okay, so now coming back over here, uh, let's go to our example over here. Suppose we wanted to create a neural network to decide if the data is below the line or above the line, if it's below the line, it belongs to class zero. If it is above the line, it belongs to class one, okay? Um, and let's pretend the decision boundary that separates the data is linear, okay? Uh, then if you take a look over here, uh, as we discussed, uh, does, is this capable of creating a straight line boundary? So if you take a look at the equation for this sum, right? Isn't it like, W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2 plus B. So regardless of what value of W1 or W2 I pick, what will be my decision boundary? Will it be a curve or will it be a line? A line. It will always be a line because remember, think of, you know, what if W1 is 2 or W2 is 3, right? Uh, so it will always be some kind of a, a straight uh, decision boundary, right? So, but what if the data is not linearly separable? So let's go back over here. Okay, so let's pretend we have some data. And for the time being, let's go to the two-dimensional space. And the data is something... So if you take a look at my example over here, let me draw the decision boundary something like Okay, so now somebody comes to you and say, oh, we want to classify this data into X's and O's, uh, and they want you to create a single neuron network just like I showed you, x1, x2, oh sorry, w1, w2, w1, w2, 1b. And again, don't worry about the activation function right now. Okay, so they wanted you to be able to, you, to train this neural network so that it can distinguish between X's and O's, but they are not linearly separated. Okay, my question to you guys is, if we created just a single neural neuron network, can it learn this kind of decision boundary? No. Absolutely not. Okay, why? Because again, you take a look at what equation is it's trying to implement. It's equation of a line or a plane, if we add more inputs to it, it just becomes a plane. Okay, so keep reminding yourself a single neuron network, no matter what you do, is a linear this 
decision boundary classifier. Okay, so now then it brings us to the next question. We want to be able to have our neural network make decisions where the boundary is nonlinear. So what should we do? Okay, so you will again get a better handle on it as we go along, but let me give you the answer without going into too much detail. So where is this? Okay, so then what we need to do is we need to create a neural network which looks like this. It will have a few neurons. Okay, it will have some inputs. And in, in our case, our decision boundary was uh, a very simple, okay, so some inputs. Okay, so in our case, actually, we had two inputs. So let me go to the two inputs, x1, x2. Okay, every neuron has a bias. Okay. And the way we connect these neurons is um, we have dense connections in a normal neural network. By dense connections, what we mean is every input feeds to every neuron. Okay, So this one will feed to over here. This one will feed to over here. This one will also feed to here and here. And same way. We just keep going. Both of these feed over here, feed over here. Okay. Then uh, let's say we have n neurons over here. Okay. Then these further, all of them feed to over here. So if we had 100 over here, there will be 100 lines feeding to this particular neuron. And this would be our output. Okay, so, so essentially, rather than using a single neuron, as you can see, now we've added one more layer over here. So in the technical terminology, we refer to this layer as the hidden layer. Okay, so anyway, as you can see, we have the input, the hidden layer, the output layer. Okay, uh, so as soon as we put a hidden layer over here, now the neat thing is it's capable of learning a nonlinear decision boundary. Okay, so, and I will show it to you in the next lecture. We'll actually plot the decision boundary and, and you can visualize it. But anyway, for today, if you can take my word that a neural network with a hidden layer is capable of learning a nonlinear decision boundary. Okay, so now the next question is how many neurons should we put in the hidden layer? Should it be two neurons? Should it be 10 neurons? Should it be 10,000 neurons, million neurons? How many? Is more the better? Okay. Uh, the answer is it depends how complex the decision boundary is. Okay. If the decision boundary was, let's say, pretty like a straight, simple curve. Then you, what you will notice is two neurons will be able to do the job. Now if the decision boundary becomes slightly more complex, okay, then you will see we need more neurons over here, maybe four or five neurons. 
if the decision boundary further becomes more and more complex, we may need a hundred or a thousand neurons over here, right? Um, so you might say, well, uh, more neurons are capable of approximating a more complex boundary. So even if it is a simple boundary, let's put thousand neurons over here. Will it work? Okay, For, forget the uh, computational cost. My question is, if I had a simple decision boundary, I put thousand neurons over here. Will it work? Yes. Okay, the answer is not as well. Okay, and, and the reason is, uh, uh, and again, you will learn this later on. If we have too complex of a model, Okay, then uh, we cause what is called overfitting, okay? And let me give you a very simple example of overfitting. Okay, let's say our decision boundary was really going to be linear. Okay, so in reality, the decision boundary was supposed to be straight line, like this. Okay, that's how we know. But our training data look like this. Okay, somebody only had a few training samples, they look like this, right? If now we put, put pass it through a thousand hidden neurons, what it will end up doing is it will end up doing something like uh, so on the training data we'll do a perfect job. But if you gave it something unknown, for example, and remember, let me draw this. Uh, sorry, it was supposed to be like this, right? Okay, so if you gave it, for example, some point, unknown point over here, meaning right, uh, let's, let's put it over here. Okay, so, in the learned model, it is above. So it will end up saying, oh, this belonged to class O. But in reality, it's below the line. It should be class zero. So on unknown data, it will perform poorly. Okay? So that's the concept called overfitting. But don't worry, we'll go over uh, this again later on. Uh, so for the time being, if we have too complex of a model, model basically means how many What's the architecture of our neural network? How many neurons in the hidden layer? How many in the output layer? And so on. So if we have a too complex of a model, we are prone to overfitting, right? So the question is, how do we know that? Uh, should we use, if this was given to us, how would we know whether we should use five neurons, 10 neurons, 100 neurons in the hidden layer? Okay. In the beginning, you will experiment. Uh, you will divide your data into a training data, test data, and what we call validation data. Okay? Uh, so you will train on this, and you'll keep validating it, see is it doing a good job on the validation. Uh, so you'll stop once you know, it does a best job on the validation.